So we have two verses, 32 and 33, from chapter number 16, Lord Parasuram destroys the ruling class, and 33 is on the board. Ye Madhu Chandal Daso Jaisya Ye Madhu Chanda So Jaisya Kusalam Maini Re Natat Asapatan Muni Grudo Malaycha Bhavata Durjanaha Ye Madhu Chandan Daso Jaisya Kusalam Maina Reina Tat Asapatan Muni Krudo Malaycha Bhavata Jurnaha Ye Madhu Chananda Ye Chadum Chanda So Jaisam Kusalam Maina Reina Tat Asapatan Muni Krudho Malaycha Bhavata Jarnaha Oh, uh -huh. 
ladies. <laughs> Word for word, yea. Those who, those who sons of celebrated as the Maruchandas, Jaistya, eldest, Kusalam, good, Minere, accepting, Na, not, Ta, that the proposal that he be accepted as the eldest brother asapat cursed tan all the sons muni malaycha disobedient to the vedic principles Bhavata, all of you become was born in the bargain and therefore the demigods involved in the sacrifice protected him. Consequently, he was also celebrated as the descendant of Gadi and Devarata. Today's verse. When requested by their father to accept Sunna Sepa as the eldest son, the elder 50 of the Maduchandas, the sons of Vishwamitra, did not agree. Therefore, Vishwamitra became angry, cursed them. May you all become bad May you all become bad son. May all of you, bad sons, become malachas, he said, being opposed to the principles of Vedic culture. Hmm. Purport. In Vedic literature, there are some names like malachas and yavanas. The malachas are understood to be those who do not follow the Vedic principles. In former days, the malachas were fewer and Vishwamita Muni cursed his sons to become malachas. But in the present age, Kali Yuga, there is no need of cursing, for people are automatically malachas. Hari Wo. Hare Krishna. I'm fortunate for the Hare Krishna Maha Mantra, <laughs> otherwise there would be no hope. This is the only beginning of Kali Yuga. But at the end of Kali Yuga, the entire population will consist of Malachas because no one will follow the Vedic principles. At that time, the incarnation of Kalki will appear. Malachya Nivaha Nidanam Kaliyasi Karabalam. He will kill all the Malachas indiscriminately with his sword. Om Agyam Timirandasya Gena Jena Salakaya. Chaksu unmilitam nena tasma shri gurave namaha shri chaitanya mano vistam saptitam yena bhutale swayam rupa kadam mayam dadati swam padanti kam jai shri krishna chaitanya prabhu nityananda shri advaita gadadhar shivasari gauda bhakta vinda hare krishna hare krishna 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 hare Hare Ram, Hare Ram, Ram Ram, Hare Hare. Hmm. So.
so yeah Srila Prabhupada he uh, came to save the Malaysians and everybody else <laughs> according to this verse there's everybody's the term is being used quite let me say broadly and sometimes it sees it means those who eat meat others it says who those who don't follow the Vedic culture others it says those who are born in Western countries sometimes there's different definitions but here it says those who don't follow or opposed to Vedic culture so this is Kali Yuga but Kali Yuga Pavana Kali Boyanasana Sri Sachinandana Namre that there there is a name I can't remember what that name is for Lord Chaitanya who comes to save the Malachas <laughs> by the mercy of his personal presence through the chanting of the holy names of the Lord today is a, a very auspicious day in the sense that we celebrate one of the most important personalities uh, in the history of Gaudiya Vaishnav culture in terms of what he contributed to Vaishnav practice and that is today is the disappearance day of Sri Madhavendra Puri so I'm going to try to speak a little bit about the qualities and some of the activities of Sri Madhavendra Puri because I think it's appropriate to honor a person who because of his presence the whole process of bhakti became uh, foremost and not only that he is the param guru of Sri Chaitanya Mahaprabhu so it's mentioned that actually by the presence and the activities of uh, Madhavendra Puri um, Sri Chaitanya Mahaprabhu actually appeared of course it's mentioned in a different way is that Chaitanya Mahaprabhu we know Sri Krishna Chaitanya Radha Krishna Nohyanya he is Radharani he's in the mood of Radharani but he is actually Krishna he's Gorangi and she is Goranga he is, she is Gorangi and he is Goranga he has her color he has her nature and he has her mood of bhakti so that was established in the process of worship by Sri Madhavendra Puri. Before them, Lakshmi Pati Tirtha, who was the guru of Madhavendra Puri, was worshiping the Lord in the form of Krishna. But then he, then Madhavendra Puri came and he actually introduced or put in place the worship Srimati Radharani alongside of Krishna. So he made a significant contribution to the whole process of bhakti by bringing about the awareness of Lord Chaitanya's presence in the form of worship by establishing worship of Radha and Krishna. Who is Madhavendra Puri? Uh, comparatively speaking he is, he is quite exalted among the great personalities. His he is actually a kalpa viksha tree in the spiritual world. This is mentioned in Gorodeshka and Deepika. There are trees in the spiritual world that Prabhupada says, whatever you want, you can get. <laughs> he said, you come to these trees in this world that has a particular fruit, that has a particular contribution, and that's the limitation. That is material, but in the spiritual world, the trees are chintamani and kalpa viksha means that whatever you desire that can be provided automatically and immediately so he is a manifestation he is actually that's his internal bhav and he's presented in this world as Sri Madhavendra Chaitanya Mahaprabhu in describing Sri Madhavendra Puri said there is no fourth person like him meant that there are only four people who actually know the deep intricate understandings of the love between Radha and Krishna and that is Chaitanya Mahaprabhu, Srimati Radharani and Madhavendra Puri. So we're talking about someone who was quite exalted 
My qualifications for speaking on something like this is completely zero. But it mentions in the first canto of Srimad Bhagavatam, and we try to understand this as an inspiration for whatever time we present our talk, is that a bird can fly into the sky, and the sky is unlimited, but the bird has a particular level of wing power, and based on that wing power, it can fly as that, that high. But the spiritual sky is unlimited, but the bird is not. So whatever the bird can do, that is according to its wing power. That say one should make an attempt to try to describe something beyond one's ability, and that attempt is bhakti or service. We make an attempt to somehow or other try to bring about the awareness of such great personalities and what they contributed in our lives and in the lives of others. So Madhavendra Puri, Chaitanya Mahaprabhu was actually traveling along with Lord Nityananda and a few of his associates and he came to the temple of Raymuna in Orissa and um, when he came he saw the beautiful deity of Kirkor Gopinath <laughs> and he offered his obeisances full dandavats Chaitanya Mahaprabhu offering full dandavats Kirkor Gopinath while he was in that position, the garland, which was made out of complete flowers on the head of Gopinath, fell and landed on the head of Chaitanya Mahaprabhu. Chaitanya Mahaprabhu immediately got up and started to dance and began kirtan. He was dancing and chanting along with his associates. He was in ecstasy. After some time, he stopped. And then he wanted to give the devotees something very special. So he was remembering the glories of Madhavendra Puri, who came there many, many years back. And Lord Chaitanya started to narrate the pastime of Madhavendra Puri, along with his most famous and all glorious deities, known as Sri Gopal. Lord Chaitanya heard this story from his spiritual master, Sri Ishwara Puri. And he, it's explained in this particular narration that when one wants to speak, one should speak according to what one has heard from one's spiritual master. That is a form of chastity. By repeating the words of the spiritual master, one is glorifying Krishna by honoring Krishna's pure representative and becoming a chaste disciple. So Lord Chaitanya wanted to make that point that actually before he narrated this story, he said, I heard this from my spiritual master, Ishwara Puri. So then he began the narration and he starts to talk and then the devotees are there. Lord Nityananda, he's also listening. And he, he says, there was this personality whose name was Madhavendra Puri. And he was traveling, he came to Govardhan. And while he was in Govardhan, he, he never used to ask for any type of food. He would simply, he wouldn't even beg. Complete Madhukari, but not even begging. He would simply... If someone offered him something he would eat, otherwise he would simply fast and just chant the glories of the Lord. So one day, he had been fasting all day and nothing came. So he was sitting underneath a tree and he was just chanting. A little beautiful boy came running up to him. He said, hey, Baba, hmm, you're fasting. In my, this is my village. No one fasts in my village. So the ladies, they saw you. And they said, oh, this Baba, he's fasting. Go bring him some milk. So they gave me this milk for you. So I'm giving you this milk. Please drink. And I'll be back because I want that pot. Because <laughs> I need the pot. Right now I have to go take care of my cows. So the boy left. And so Madhavendra Puri, he took, he saw this boy is quite beautiful. <laughs> And then he starts to, he drinks the milk, he drinks the whole milk, and then he falls to sleep. And it's late in the evening. And when he falls to sleep, the same boy who gave him the milk appears in his dream. 
and the boy is smiling. And so now he's seeing that that same boy is actually the Supreme Personality of Godhead. And then he wakes up and he's, he's experiencing ecstasy in a dream and then he wakes up and then he's thinking, oh no, Krishna came and I didn't even recognize him. Just see how, fo how foolish I am. But then he even felt even worse. I accepted service from the Supreme Personality of God. This is intolerable. We should be serving the Lord. How can we accept service from the Lord? But Prabhupada talks about this in his own life, that Krishna wants to serve his devotee more than the devotee wants to serve Krishna. And Prabhupada said, there's a competition. When the devotee wants to serve Krishna, the devotee tries as hard as he can, or she can, to do whatever is possible to offer Krishna something in the most nicest way. And then Krishna... He, because Krishna is great and everything he does is great, so what we offer is just insignificant. And Krishna, Prabhupada says, we give with two hands, he takes with ten. And he gives back with ten and we can only hold with two. So everything he's giving, we're dropping, you know, <laughs> so we can't hold it. And that's his mercy. Well, that's Krishna. He loves to serve his devotees. Uh, in fact, he says, I'm popular. People glorify me. Lakshmi, she comes. Brahma and Shiva glorify me because I'm the servant of my devotees. That's my qualification. <laughs> this is Krishna. That's his humility. He's glorifying those who, who serve him as being his own credit for what he is. This is Krishna. So now, after he wakes up in the dream, and he's waiting for that boy to return, but the boy never returns. And so now he goes back to sleep, and again he has another dream. And this dream is very significant, which is the foundation to this whole pastime. In the dream, the same boy comes and says, you know, I'm in the bushes out here. I've been here for the longest time. When the Muslims attacked, the priest who was taking care of me, he hid. And he took me in these bushes, and I've been here for a long time. And I'm cold, so come and find me. So, clear dream, everything is there. So he wakes up, and he's got this, you know, instruction to find Gopal. And so he goes, and he tells some of the Govardhan Basis there, some of the men, and some of the ladies, and they all get excited, so they take their swords and sheets and glass grass clearers and they go and somehow he knows exactly where to go by the dream and he they're digging and cutting and they come and they find this beautiful beautiful deity of Krishna and he's all covered with leaves and dirt and he's wet and he's been underground for a long time so they're trying to lift him but they can't he's heavy he's <laughs> really heavy so they get some more men. Finally, some of the strong men come and they pick up the deity. Everyone's excited. Oh, Gopal's appear right here. We should offer worship. So now, Madhavendra Puri takes charge. He finds a hill. And he, the men get these big, big, big stones. And they put the deity on the stone and they put a stone in his back. And now he starts to orchestrate a wonderful worship for the deity. So then they first, they start bringing water from Manasi Ganga and other holy places, and they're bathing the deity. And after they're bathing the deity, they're drying the deity, and people are bringing garments and so many wonderful cloths to decorate the deity so nicely. So this is going on. Finally, the deity is so nicely decorated. Everyone is excited. More and more people are finding out. They're also coming. Now it's time to offer something. So now people are bringing boga. It's mentioned they brought rice and atta and milk and butter and yogurt and so many products. And Madhavendra Puri is just orchestrating this wonderful offering to Gopa. And so it's like it was described, it was like an Anakuta ceremony. Just like when Krishna lifted Govardhan Hill and they had a wonderful feast orchestrated by Krishna, but in the Brajabhasis and all they had brought all these things. This is the whole pastime of Govardhan Hill. 
In the same way, this pastime was happening again with Madhavendra Puri. And people were bringing everything. And so that day finished. The deity took rest. And the next day, same thing. And people were bringing more boga and various types of gifts. And this went on for two months. Every day there was an Anakut ceremony for two months. And the play, everything was just so wonderful. This deity was so beautiful. He's now established in Rajasthan? Yes, yeah. You can go. Prabhupada said you can go and see him. <laughs> huh? Sri? Sri? Sri Nachi. Yeah, it's Sri Nachi. Yeah, it's actually Sri Nachi. And so, after two months, this is going on. And finally, uh, the worship continues. And then... After, and then Madhavendra Puri, yeah, he wants to travel, so he puts some of the Brahmins in charge of the worship, and he goes traveling. He comes back, and now it's four years later. And this time again, he has a dream. And again, Gopal, same Gopal, now he's established. He says, you know, it's hot <laughs> and I want to cool off <laughs> so I want some sandalwood so please bring me some sandalwood pour, pulp from Jagannath Puri now he's in Govardhan Govardhan to Jagannath Puri it's not an easy trek but Madhavendra Puri doesn't think in terms of oh this is a long way I gotta find He's thinking, I have an opportunity to serve the Lord. He's requesting. And, and in the narration, it mentions here that the devotee is always eager to serve, no matter how difficult it may be. Sometimes Krishna will give us some situation that it's not so easy, or it's not our nature. <laughs> Something that makes it, what we say, what we call it a little hesitant, but a devotee says, thank you. Here's an opportunity to surrender. The more difficult, or apparently difficult, we shouldn't say difficult, but apparently difficult that the service that we have somehow been given for, in one form or another is a greater opportunity to take shelter of Krishna. It's a greater opportunity to, to become more and more surrendered. And so the Lord, and the Lord Prabhupada said, Krishna will never test you. Jai Sri Sri Radha Madhava Astasaki Ki Prabhupada said, Krishna will never test you beyond your ability to pass the test. I remember we used to hear that when we were brahmacharis, because in those days, you know, a lot of times we had to do services that were really, really hard. Living in New Vrindavan, we had nothing. In fact, all we had was two things, cold weather and mud. And mud was all year round and cold weather was just seasonal. So thank God anyway. But we had a lot, we didn't have anything. So trying to establish New Vrindavan in those days like was really difficult. But, you know, we, we were told, Krishna will never test you beyond your ability to pass. So just do your best and Krishna will help you. And so that's how we were understanding. This is, how, this is the mood of surrender. That whatever the Lord wants by giving us instructions through his pure representative. So, Madhavendra Puri, he's going. And he's on his way to Jagannath Puri. He puts the Brahmins in charge of the worship of Sri Nachi and he leaves. On his way, he stops in the temple of Rangmuna. And he comes and uh, he meets the priest. The priest is describing ever some of the boga offerings that they make to the deity. And he's really quite interested in hearing it because he's thinking, I would like to also know what they offer to, to Gopinath. 
because I want to offer that to my deity also. And I want to offer that to Sri Nachi. So he's hearing. Now there's a special offering, and there's that they offer these many, many pots of kheer. It's a very special type of kheer. And it's, you can't find it anywhere else in the world. How many of you have been to Rimuna and had those, that, those pots of kheer? It's really quite amazing. Uh, we were there twice in two different occasions and had the opportunity. And they give you a little tiny pot. It's about this big and it's full with kheer. And you just eat it and you think, I want more. <laughs> It's so, I, I don't want to try to describe what it tastes like because I can't. It's an experience. <laughs> it's, it's really an experience. And then, of course, after we're done, we keep the pots. <laughs> but then we got tricked one time. Some of the brahmacharis who were serving us collected the pots. And then after I gave my pot, I thought, what did I do? I gave up the pot. The pot is just as good as the cure. <laughs> Because of, the, because of this particular pastime. So now the offering is just being made and Madhavendra Puri is there. Now he's thinking as the offering's being made, boy, it would be nice to know what is the taste of this offering. I want to make it for, for, for Gopal. And then the offering is completed and then he realizes he starts to think, oh no, I'm such an offender. What a foolish person I am. What did I do? I'm thinking about the offering while it's still being made. So he felt really bad. So immediately he just left the temple and went into the town and just found some place to sit and chant. And gradually night came and he fell asleep. During the night, the priest, who was taking care of the deity, had a dream. And in the dream, Gopinath appears to the priest in the dream and says, I have hidden one of the pots of cure. You didn't see it, but please come and get it. And there's my devotee. His name is Madhavendra Puri. He's still here. Bring him this pot. So the priest He's amazed. He, he, he wakes up and then he realizes I should take bath. So he takes bath and he goes and behind the curtain where, you know, the pots weren't there in the first place, there's this pot of cure. There was eight pots and uh, Gopinath had hidden it. And so he took the cure. Now he's walking through the town. Look, he's calling out. Oh, Gopinath has stolen this, this cure for you, Madhavendra Puri, please come, please come. And he's calling and finally Madhavendra Puri hears his name's coming. He sees this person walking, so he comes up and then they see each other. When they see each other, their natural love for each other starts to awaken and they just start to embrace. And each one is thinking how fortunate the other person is. is because it's mentioned in his pastime that this priest was as good as Madhavendra Puri in his bhakti because Gopinath appeared to him in a dream and spoke to him and told him to do this service. So this priest was, was actually a great, great personality. So now he gets the cure and he's glorifying Gopinath and then he sits down and immediately starts to taste it. He eats the whole pot and then he keeps the pot and every day he takes a piece of the pot, he breaks the pot and he's eating the pot. So, because it's just as good as the cure. Because it's, it's prashad, it's been offered on the altar, non-different. And, uh, and so, but now he's thinking, after some time he's thinking, oh no, I'm going to get a reputation. People are going to understand what happened and everyone's going to come and try to worship me and start to talk and say nice things about me. So one day he just disappeared. He didn't want worship. That was, that's the nature of a great soul. Although they are worshipable and sometimes they may receive worship just to, to 
accept the good wishes and the good offerings of others. On the personal level, they're only interested in giving worship rather than accepting worship. So this was the nature of Madhavarani Puri. And so he disappeared. And so now he's on his way to Jagannath Puri and he finally arrives in Puri. And then he starts to find some of the devotees who are in the Jagannath temple, some of the pandas, and he explains his mission. I need sandalwood paste for my deity. But they said it's under government control and no one can get it unless the government releases control. So Madhavendra Puri, along with some of the officials in the Jagannath temple, they went to the officials and got the release. And he got 82 pounds, it's mentioned pounds, of sandalwood and nine ounces of camphor. And now he's happy. But now he has to go from Jagannath Puri all the way back to Govardhan. And that's a long way. And there's a lot of toll collectors where they have to pay some tax to go through. There's also Muslims who might attack. But Madhavendra Puri knows that this is what the deity wants, so he's fearless. And he has some of his associates coming from Jagannath Puri. They also came with him to help him carry. On his way back, he stops again in the Ramuna temple. He comes and sees the deity. Again, he falls asleep. Now, again, the Lord appears to him in a dream. This is the third time. And in the dream, the Lord said, My dear Mother Vendra Puri, you are such a, you are my great devotee. You are taking such difficulties and hardships just to serve me. But you know, Gopinath and me, we're non different. So you please stay here and you rub that paste on Gopinath every day and I will be cool. <laughs> so the deity was actually giving him a chance to serve Gopinath at the same time relieving him of this hardship of travel. So he stayed there and he just offered that to Gopinath. Every day he stayed there and offered the sandalwood paste. And the, uh, so the, this is another example of how the Lord likes to serve his devotee. Although the devotee doesn't ask for service, still the, devotee, the Lord is serving his devotee. So Chaitanya Mahaprabhu, he's narrating this pastime. And his narration is just, it's not just talking. He's fully animated. Who is this Madhavendra Puri? He is such a great soul. The Lord appeared to him in dreams three different times to give him instructions how to serve. And then he starts glorifying that. And Nityananda is there and he's hearing that. And when they're hearing the narration, by, and then when Lord Chaitanya finished the narration, they had kirtan and they all started the dance glorifying Madhavendra Puri. I mean, to be glorified by Chaitanya Mahaprabhu in an ecstatic way, what is the qualification of Madhavendra Puri? What is the quality? So this is a beautiful pastime, but there are many others. Madhavendra Puri did something later in his life, in his elderly age. He had many disciples. Of course, his most prominent disciple was the spiritual master of Lord Chaitanya, Sri Ishpara Puri. But he had another disciple named Ramachandra Puri. Ramachandra Puri wasn't quite up to the standard of bhakti. He still had tendencies of Brahman realization, was, was superior to bhakti. Although he was a follower of Madhavendra Puri. Madhavendra Puri in his later days went into complete ecstasy and in that ecstasy he was exhibiting separation from Krishna just crying and calling to the Lord from within his heart my dear Lord I'll never be able to achieve you 
my situation is so foolish. How will I ever get the chance to get your lotus feet? And he's calling and crying and it's, you know, it's being heard. Finally, Ramachandra Purdy, he hears this. He comes up to his spiritual master. He says, Guru Maharaj, just be peaceful. Brahma Bhuta, Prasannatma, Nasoshati, Nakangshati, Sama Sarveshu, Bhuteshu, Madhbhakti, Blagvate, Praman. Yeah, this is the verse. Be peaceful. Don't lament, don't hanker, you know, equipoised, you know, Dida. <laughs> and this is what he's telling his spiritual master. And Madhavendra Puri, he looks at him and says, oh no, get out of here. <laughs> immediately leave my presence. If I just happen to see your shadow, what to speak of your face. <laughs> When I'm leaving this body, then my destination is very uh, difficult to understand. Um, so he criticized. He tried to instruct this spiritual master. It's mentioned that one should not try to instruct the spiritual master. Sometimes the spiritual master asks for instructions. If he does, then you can offer it in a humble way. But you always say, my dear spiritual master, you know the answer. You're just giving me a chance to serve you. That's all. <laughs> Sometimes we, we may find ourselves doing that. The spiritual master is making a mistake or doing something wrong. Like sometimes Srila Prabhupada would quote a verse. And he'd quote the verse differently than the actual verse. He'd use a different word in the place of the verse of the word. And sometimes devotees would think, and I think on a couple of occasions there was some, but Prabhupada accepted the correction in a humble way, but later on that devotee was chastised by others. How can you do that to Prabhupada? You can't correct him. If he makes a mistake, Prabhupada used to say, my spiritual master is wrong, but he's right. I mean, that's a hard one to figure out because sometimes we see things on the material level and based on right and wrong. But the spiritual master is empowered by the, the, the Lord to purify his, his disciples. And sometimes he actually does things that the disciple cannot understand. And just to somehow or other, just like there's one story like I heard this story. This is an interesting story where one devotee of Srila Prabhupada, Prabhupada was in Vrindavan and Prabhupada was in his quarters in Vrindavan and Prabhupada would leave his quarters, go to the temple and then return. And when he would leave, he would put his shoes, when he would put his shoes on, he'd go to the temple, leave it there and then take his shoes back and put it in front of the door and then he would go in. And it was these nice white, kind of like um, slipper type shoes. So one devotee, he was watching Prabhupada and he was thinking, I want to get those shoes. So he goes to town, he finds the exact same kind, buys it. And he's thinking, you know, when Prabhupada, I can see him, he comes back and forth. So when he goes in, I'm going to switch the shoes and I'll have Prabhupada's shoes. So he's all ready. He's ready for this one occasion. So Prabhupada's coming back from the temple. And he's all ready to make the switch. This time Prabhupada walks into the room with his shoes on. <laughs> he never did it. And this devotee's thinking, he never does that. <laughs> he just did it this time, the time I was going to switch it. The next day Prabhupada was in class and he was giving class. He said, don't try to play tricks on your spiritual master. <laughs> and then later on, he came to the devotee and he said, you want my shoes? <laughs> and he gave it to him. <laughs> so this is a nice little innuendo to understand, you know, sometimes we try to... One time one devotee was wanted to see what Prabhupada was doing in his room. So he looked through the keyhole and he saw an eye looking back at him from the other <laughs> So yeah, even 
So that's true. If you try to figure out your spiritual master or you try to second guess, Krishna will always make you wrong. Just to show that that's not your position. And so Ramachandra Puri, he had committed this great offense. Now it explained that when one commits an offense, especially Guru Aparad, this was a major Aparad, one's material desires start to return. Sometimes that happens, we see devotees leave Krishna consciousness because of offenses. And when offenses occur, we lose the taste. And when we lose the taste, then we sometimes, we again, look towards material life to fulfill that taste. And so therefore, one should be very careful, especially in relationship to devotees, not to commit offenses. But this Ramachandra Puri, he had a certain tendency he would criticize everyone. He would buy prasadam for all the devotees of Lord Chaitanya. He would sit them down and then he would feed them and he would always say, eat more, eat more, eat more, eat more. And then just to please him, they would eat more. And then he would say, just see, Lord Chaitanya's devotees, they eat too much. <laughs> and then he would criticize the devotee for eating too much. This was his nature. And then, you know, then Lord Chaitanya also, when he found out about that, he cut his eating in half. He cut his eating in half, and that made the devotees really unhappy. Really unhappy. And one day, the Ramachandra Puri came, because when Ramachandra Puri would come to see Lord Chaitanya, Lord Chaitanya would see him as the, spirit, as the god brother of his spiritual master. And so you worship the god brother of your spiritual master on the same level you worship your spiritual master. That is etiquette. So Lord Chaitanya would pay respects to Ramachandra Puri. And Ramachandra Puri would immediately find some fault. He would say, oh, you're a sannyasi, but you eat too much. And then he would say, look, there's ants in your room. You're hiding sweets all during the day. When nobody's awake, you're eating sweets at night. And he would tell everyone. And the devotees would never believe him. So Lord Chaitanya, uh, you know, he didn't say anything to Ramachandra Puri. He just cut his eating in half. And then he would continue to criticize. And Prabhupada writes in this purport, there's ants everywhere. And now he's thinking, because I see ants in the room, he must be eating sweets. So then he went on to criticize the Supreme Personality of Godhead. And then finally, after some time, the devotees were praying. Because Lord Chaitanya wouldn't do anything against Ramachandra Puri, because he respected him. And he accepted his criticism. But the devotees were not happy. And finally, after some time, uh, Ramachandra Puri left. And when Ramachari Puri left, all the devotees became happy. <laughs> and then Lord Chaitanya resumed his regular eating habits because the devotees, when they heard that the Lord was reducing his eating so drastically, they think, this is our service. We want to see the Lord eat more and more and more. We want to provide so many nice foodstuffs. And when he accepts our offerings, this is the greatest happiness we can achieve. So they were so unhappy when he had cut his eating. But now Ramachandra Puri had left. So Madhavendra Puri, we can't say wanted to show, but did show that one... Okay, I left out one point. Ishwar Puri became the spiritual master of Lord Chaitanya. Why? Because he served Ram Madhavendra Puri in the most menial and humble way. When Madhavendra Puri was so old and unable to take care of his own body, Ram, uh, Ishwara Puri would come and take care of all the menial services, cleaning the stool, cleaning the urine, cleaning up everything, serving his spiritual master in the best possible way. And therefore he, got, he was blessed by, by Madhavendra Puri. And that blessing 
gave him the uh, situation to achieve the, the position of being the spiritual master of Lord Chaitanya, at least acting in that, because no one can be the spiritual master of the Lord. But he had the privilege of actually being in that capacity as Lord Chaitanya plays the part of a uh, great devotee. So the point that, Ra that Madhavendra Puri showed is that one who displeases, offends the spiritual master, their devotional creeper is destroyed. And one who pleases the spiritual master, then the path of devotional service is wonderful. So that is the mindset of a devotee, how to please the Lord, how to please the spiritual master. The spiritual master is pleased simply by the sincere effort of a devotee. One of the things that pleases the spiritual master is to see the devotees that have taken initiation to follow, chanting 16 rounds following those four principles. I think, at least this is my understanding, it, it causes the greatest unhappiness in the spiritual master when he sees his disciples no longer up to the standard. For some reason, they go below 16 rounds, although they made the vow, although they made the promise in front of the fire, no longer following. But if one simply follows these principles, four regulative principles and chants 60 rounds, spiritual master is pleased. He's pleased. And whatever service we can do beyond that is wonderful. Okay, so I want to leave maybe a few moments for questions. So we, do we have any questions or comments on Madhavendra Puri or any points? Yes, uh, John Masami Prabhu. <laughs> do we have a mic? It's coming. Mm -hmm. Well, as you quoted Prabhupada <clears throat> with this famous saying that Krishna will never give us a test that we can't pass. <clears throat> one, <clears throat> one time I brought this up in a class, you know, I gave a class, hmm. and a devotee said, but it seems like a lot of devotees had tests that they didn't pass. And um, I was a little unsure how to handle that because a lot of, lot of like you mentioned, uh, devotees sometimes they don't stay with their... Um, their vows. The purpose of a test is to elevate the devotee, bring him to a higher standard of surrender, knowledge, devotion. So these tests mean that we have to make a greater effort. If that effort's not there, then it appears that Krishna's giving me something I can't do. But what Prabhupada is saying, you have the capacity. Like Maybe a test you can't pass is like what Prabhupada said to one reporter. When Prabhupada was in New York, he, one reporter was criticizing Prabhupada for sitting on a Vyasasan. Devotees had brought a Vyasasan to the airport <laughs> and Prabhupada was accepting the Vyasasan and there were some reporters there who had came to interview Prabhupada. So one, pro, pro, one reporter, he, you know, was a little bit upset and you could say he was envious and so he just made his question why do you have to sit on that fancy seat and Prabhupada's answer was interesting he said I can be of in a room full of naked women and not be disturbed that was the answer <laughs> So what he was saying is, and you know, when, when he said that, all the colleagues of the reporter, they started to laugh, you know. He was embarrassed. Prabhupada was saying, you know, there's nothing in this material world that's, you know, that I'm attracted to. Prabhupada was situated on a pure transcendental consciousness. So if we were given a test like that, would we pass? <laughs> so, so Krishna won't give you a test like that. <laughs> Krishna won't give you a test that you can pass, like something impossible. But it appears that something may be a little bit beyond our ability. 
But then what you do is you inquire about it, you try to understand it deeper, talk to other devotees and see. But you may even say, my dear spiritual master, this is too difficult. Can you give me something else? And if he says no, then... Yeah. But if he says, all right, no. But sometimes it's for, for our, it's ob obviously always for our good to get something a little difficult. It brings out the good qualities of the devotee. Just like I preach in jails a lot, and sometimes I meet the people who are devotees before they were in jail, and but their devotion is much better now when they're in jail, yeah. Much better than it was before. Chanting 16, more than 16 rounds, only eating whatever they can in the vegetarian you know, category, preaching to other people. I mean, they're making the best situation out of this, you know, horror. And being in jail is not easy. It's tough, really difficult. The environment is not at all conducive. But many of them exhibit wonderful devotional qualities in that situation. Should I tell you a story? Yeah. Where I, there's one inmate. He's, uh, he's been initiated by Vaisheshika Prabhu a couple years ago. And uh, he was a gang member and he was in Los Angeles, California, and he killed eight people. <laughs> so he's in, he's in jail for life and he's not going to get out. So he also writes me and you know, we go back and forth. So now, and he's, he's completely changed. He's really gentle. He's reads Chaitanya Charitamrita, tries to give Krishna consciousness to others. So one day, because in jail they have this, what they call the yard, where you go out and you can do some kind of, you know, calisthenics or run, it's like a recreation area. And so the inmates kind of like can associate with each other. So while he was in the yard, one man came up to him and said, are you Ben Baker? He said, yes. He said, oh, you killed my best friend. And then he tries to attack Ben. Now Ben is not a small guy. I mean, he's small in size, but he's powerful. So, Normally, if he would have been attacked, you know, he would have just finished the guy off. But he didn't. He just grabbed him, held him down, and kept him until the guards came. He didn't hurt him at all. And later on, he wrote me a letter. He said, I really surprised myself. <laughs> you know, usually I would have finished him off. But, but Lord Chaitanya and Lord Nityananda, you know, I'm changed. <laughs> He was really changed. He was given all credit to Lord Nityananda because Lord Nityananda, when he was attacked, and so yeah, he, there's a significant quality in the character of people who are practicing Krishna consciousness in jail. So that's a difficult test, obviously, but and not everybody passes that test. Mm -hmm. Sometimes they submerge. They they. What we say, they buckle under the pressure of being in jail and it becomes too much. You know. But some of them, the ones that, that actually stick to Krishna consciousness are glorious. You know. Wonderful devotees, many of them. But again, Krishna won't give you something that you can't pass. Because he does, Prabhupada said, he doesn't want to destroy your bhakti by doing that. That's the, that's the consequence. If you can't pass it, then you're, you know, you may go down in Krishna consciousness. So, so. Yes, uh, Mandakini? Yes. Mm -hmm. Mandakini Mataji. Your French is very strong, so please speak yes. slowly. 
I'll try. <laughs> okay. So first, thank you very much for that, Maharaj, for that very enlivening glorification of Madhavendra Puri. Uh, I was wondering what happened to Ramachandra Puri, because in a way he did uh, some service yeah. serving as an example for future generations. It's said that he left and went traveling and went to holy places. So he had that inclination yet. But that's as much as I've read. I'm sure you could, with a little research, maybe somebody knows what happened to Ramachandra Puri afterwards. But I'm not aware beyond that. Yeah. Thank you. Prabhu, you have a question? Yes. Hare Krishna Maharaj. Maharaj, uh, my question is like we are totally dependent on Krishna. Then how can we avoid taking services from Krishna? How can you avoid taking services from Krishna? Try, see what happens. <laughs> <laughs> Sometimes devotees know how to do that because they can say, oh, Krishna is trying to serve me, so they do something to avoid that. But generally, because we have the story of Rupa Goswami and Sanatana Goswami, and when Rupa Goswami was giving all kinds of nice boga for, his, for to cook a feast for Sanatana Goswami, and not knowing who the person was, it was actually Srimati Radharani, he cooked a nice feast for Sanatana's birthday, and then Sanatana could understand after he tasted it. <laughs> this is, you know, as he, and then when Rupa Goswami describes the person, he said, where did you get all this from? He said, well, we don't have nothing, we're just living under a different tree. So, you know, this very sweet little girl, she came and said, hey, Baba, I got something for you here, cook. And then he describes her, and then Sanatana Goswami could understand it was Srimati Radharani. He chastised Rupa Goswami for that. So you have to use your intelligence. But sometimes, if Krishna wants to serve you, you take that service he gives you and you turn it around by serving him with whatever he gives you. Because that's in one of the reasons why he wants to serve his devotees, so his diverse devotees can have more opportunities to serve him. So it's always, you can, whatever it is, then it can be used to serve Krishna. <laughs> okay, Sri Devi. Uh, my question is, is this something that happens as we grow in bhakti because um, at least in the beginning stages we are so dependent on Krishna for everything and we turn to him in all situations like a loving parent or a loving father like a child depending on the father so we are asking Krishna please give me intelligence please give me protection please give me you know the right uh, vision to do things properly so we are constantly praying for something to Krishna uh, and asking from him rather than giving him something. So I'm just wondering whether it's a stage when you mature in bhakti that you're actually giving back to Krishna? Hmm, good question. It depends on your consciousness. For some, they don't want to ask anything and whatever Krishna provides, that's fine. Others may feel that I need to do this service and so somehow or other they try to get the, op the facility, the intelligence, the ability and I pray to the Lord to provide that. So that's also nice. Depends on what level of realization you're on. <laughs> Thank you. Okay, so it's... Oh, yes, Pankajangri Prabhu. Mm -hmm. Please correct 
Um, as regards to uh, Ram Chandra Puri, mm. in uh, Krishna Leela, he is Jatila. Jatila. Mm. He, was... he had sort of spice of the story. Mm. But the, the thing is that Mahaprabhu never, the, the devotees didn't like it, but the Mahaprabhu mm. never object, objected. Yeah. He never tried to counteract or he always held him in great respect. And sometimes he said, yes, he's right. What he's saying, sannyasi shouldn't eat so much. But yeah, that's his, that was his pastime. <clears throat> yeah, he he never n never objected and even said he's right. <laughs> and so uh, Pankajangri Prabhu was mentioning that he is Jatila in Krishna Leela. <laughs> so and there's the connection. <laughs> yeah, and I'm sure Mahaprabhu could understand that also. <laughs> Okay, thank you very much for that interesting point. Thank you very much. Srila Prabhupada Ki Jai. Srimad Bhadrapuri Ki Jai. Srimad Bhagavatam Ki Jai.